Okay, welcome everybody to our Sabbath worship service here at the Phoenix Seventh-day Baptist Church. All right? All right. Is that how we are officially recognized? Or Anyway, um, let's just start uh, with an opening prayer, then we'll sing Blessed Assurance. And uh, maybe sing another song after that. And uh, we'll go from there. Anyway, let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you so much for well, all of your blessings, Lord. But today we're especially grateful for the Sabbath day when we can get together and uh, just put all of our worldly concerns aside and just focus on loving you, adoring you, spending time in fellowship with one another. I'd just like to ask you to be here among us, Lord, and uh, send your Holy Spirit to fill us and just to uh, accept our worship. In your name, Jesus. Amen. Okay, I meant to do the scripture reading between those two, but that's okay. Let's do it now. It's uh, 2 Chronicles chapter 7 verse 14. My people, if my people who are called by my name humble themselves and pray and seek, seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven, will forgive their sin, and will heal their land. Well, <clears throat> the title of the sermon today is Church and State. And uh, Initially, I intended to uh, do a sermon to encourage everyone to vote, you know, as if anyone who can vote in our congregation actually needs to be motivated to vote. I think we are pretty active that way. But, you know, I didn't want to get political. Still, what motivated me to venture into this topic was uh, I, I read somewhere last week that uh, at the last election we had there were 32 million Christians, self-professed Christians who did not bother to vote. I think about how big a portion that is of the electorate. It's probably like, I think I, think I figured out is close to 20% of the people that they expect to vote. And I know a lot of them are probably nominal Christians and who knows which way they'll vote. But uh, a lot of them, even if they are very much Christian, you don't, you don't know for sure where they're gonna decide to uh, go with their vote. But uh, it just, it just galled me that we, the people who are the government in this country, that, you know, we see the way the country is going and there are Christians out there that don't want to try to have any influence on who we're going to choose to uh, go to Washington and represent us. Now this verse is not, doesn't deal directly with that, but I, I just saw this verse when I looked up, you know, 
Bible verses about about voting. So I saw that one. I thought, well, this is one that it, it's close enough, and it's one I always want to talk about whenever I get a chance because it does direct us, you know, to to seek God and to bring our society back in line with His morality, and then. He'll heal our land, make everything okay. But if you read this verse in context, let's do that now. But that will start at verse, uh, you know, Second Chronicles seven. Let's start at verse twelve. But first, let me uh, give the context of this. This was act actually, uh, I think it was right after Solomon had. Uh, finished the temple he built for the Lord, you know. And uh, I think they had consecrated it. And then the Lord appeared to him. Verse 12. Then the Lord appeared to Solomon at night and said to him, I have heard your prayer and have chosen this place for myself as a house of sacrifice. If I, oops, if I shut up the heavens so that there is no rain, or if I command the locusts to devour the land, or if I send pestilence among my people, and my people who are called by my name humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven will forgive their sin and will heal their land. People always focus just on verse 14 there. And I think they take it out of context even there. People think that, you know, if, if we just do these things, if we humble ourselves and pray and seek God again and turn from our wicked ways, then he will hear from heaven. He's promising if we'll do that, He'll turn, hear us from heaven and he'll forgive our sin and heal our land. And then, you know, America will be made right again. The thing is, like I said, when you read it in context, no such promise is made to us. In fact, this was given to the people of Israel right after Solomon finished the temple. And it didn't look like a promise to me. Once you read it in context, it sounds like a warning. It says, you know, if, you know, we could go one, of, they could go one of two ways. But, you know, that being said, you know, I just wanted to get on record that we can't ever get God in a box where we can say, if we do this, then he'll have to do this. God's never going to go there. But, he does tend to bless those of us who submit to him and worship him, try to live as he would have us live. So, I'm not going to say that God won't heal our land if we do these things. He might. He probably will. I just didn't want to, and I just don't like it when people say, well, He has to if we do these things. He promised. No, He didn't. He didn't promise us. He didn't promise at all. But He might. In fact, I think He would. We were, in fact, once, and in fact, once we did govern ourselves as we believed God would have us govern ourselves. That's changed, though, hasn't it? We've kind of drifted away. I mean, we've really, really drifted away. But I think we started out intending to live as a Christian people, as a Christian nation. 
think that's what we uh, had in mind, and that's the recording is actually from a guy named Charlie Kirk, and I, some of you know who he is. Uh, a lot of people don't. How many of you knew that he's a fellow Sabbath keeeper? Not until you told us. <laughs> <laughs> he is. Now, uh, he works down here in the valley. That's where he broadcasts, does his broadcast every day from. But I, I'm not sure he lives down here, but he, every Friday night, uh, when he, or I guess it's Friday during the day when he does the broadcast. I listen to it at night. I, uh, they rebroadcast it. But by then, you know, the sun has usually gone down. And he signs off Friday after his Friday broadcast, and he says, Shabbat Shalom, everybody. He tells everybody, go home and have yourself a Sabbath. And Charlie Kirk, um, he does the best job of making the case that we were intended to be if not a Christian nation in, in that we would only be a nation of Christians, but it, that we were intended to be a Christian nation in that uh, we almost all were Christian and we wanted to govern ourselves according to Christian precepts. So uh, it, this is, he, he does this all in about two and a half, three minutes. And he talks a little fast, so, so maybe uh, go ahead and play it and just Pay close, pay close attention. So, Amen. he just, like I said, he runs it down real quick. You know, someday we ought to invite him to come spend the Sabbath with us. Because I don't think he, I don't think he uh, goes to church on Sabbath. I think he keeps it at home. Invite him here sometime. Yeah, that's what I was saying. We should invite him here. So maybe he could speak. <laughs> mm -hmm. Of course, he'd probably want an honorarium that we couldn't afford. But, or maybe he'd just come to fellowship. But anyway, so I, like I said, uh, this is not entirely uncontroversial. And when people say, you know, they point out, okay, yeah, all the state governments said, you know, you, you actually had to, you know, sign a statement of faith in order to be able to uh, hold a state office and this and that and the other thing. But we uh, we uh, put in the supremacy clause, and we didn't have, and we said, you know, you can't establish a state religion and all that, which is true. It's true. Um, but I don't think well, they didn't at first. Uh, even after they ratified the Constitution, they didn't uh, outlaw the, uh, the uh, provisions in the state laws that uh, said, you know, you have to be, you know, sign a statement of faith in order to hold public office. Uh, over time, that changed. But uh, I think it's pretty clear that, uh, especially from what John Adams said, that we, our government was structured according to biblical principles. Like he, he pointed out Deuteronomy, I mean, that's where we get our branches of government and everything, I think. And we, we were basically, you know, our, our, our structure of government was such that we were, it was only good for governing a religious people. So, yeah, it wasn't just for Christians. They, you know, there were not just Christians in America, but almost everyone was Christian. So we made a, a government to govern Christians, and we lived as a very Christian nation for a while. But, like I said, we have really strayed. We have really strayed. I 
Proverbs 14.34 says, you know, righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a disgrace to any people. I think at this point we've pretty well, you know, collectively anyway, disgraced ourselves as a nation. So, I'm just wondering, if we do somehow, you know, those of us who call ourselves by His name, if all of us come back to Him and start living like we are His, does that mean He's just going to let everything that everybody else has done and doing go? I mean, you, you guys have seen some of the monstrous laws we've had lately that are just seem to be demonic. <laughs> Is God not going to punish that? I mean, well, let's also look at a uh, well, Deuteronomy. One, uh, chapter one, starting at verse thirteen. Oops. So this is how we were supposed to uh, govern ourselves all along. Choose wise and discerning and experienced men from your tribes, and I will appoint them as your heads. Have we done that lately? I think a lot of us have tried, but in verse 14, you answered me and said, the thing which you have said to do is good. So I took the heads of your tribes, wise and experienced men, apparently this is Moses talking to God, and appointed them heads over your lead, of, over you. Or maybe this is God talking to Moses. I should look at the context better. Anyway, it says, so I took the heads of your tribes, wise and experienced men and appointed them heads over you, leaders of thousands, of hundreds, of fifties, of tens, and officers for your tribes. That's initially what we did. Then I charged your judges at, at that time, saying, Hear the cases between your fellow countrymen and judge righteously between a man and his fellow countrymen, or the alien who is with him. You shall not show partiality in judgment. You shall not or you shall hear the small and the great alike. When I see what some of the judges have done lately, I'm mortified that we leave them in power. And, and I'm not talking about just some of the judges, the things that judges have done to our political, like our, our elections lately. Uh, they, they, they've gotten completely out of hand in general. Um, Recently, I was uh, reading about a fellow, I, I don't remember his name, but he was one of those uh, who was charged back when uh, there was this big scandal where a lot of people in Hollywood had uh, gone to a certain service to uh, that, that millions of people go to to, to get help uh, getting their kids prepared for college and, and registered in college and, and all that. But what these people got in trouble for was they, uh, the guy the guy that uh, was helping them, for money of course, to get their kids into college, said, well, your kids are only going to get in if you bribe your way in. So they bribed some of the universities. And they busted it on. And they sent some of them to jail. But there was one fellow who said, you know what? Yeah, I used his service like millions of people do. And he recommended I make some donations to the college. And I did. They weren't that big. And my kids did get in on the basis of their qualifications. His, one of his sons was a swimmer. A great swimmer. He, he, he got a scholarship to be on the swimming team and he did good on it. His daughter, his daughter got scholarships too. 
And so he just told the federal government, you know, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna plead guilty to this. They just said, just plead guilty, take your punishment like the others. And he said, no, I didn't do it. So, you know what they told him? And the judge went along with it all along. They said, plead guilty or we'll add another charge. And they did. And he said, well, I'm, I'm still not pleading guilty. I'm gonna fight this. He said, well, then we're gonna add another charge if you don't. And it was basically the same thing. They just found different ways to word it. Like you've seen them doing that, a certain judge doing that uh, in, to a certain political candidate lately. Well, they did this like, I think, like 10 times. They just stacked them on and he wouldn't give up. And he, he lost in court because they, the judge basically uh, said, you know, no, you can't bring any evidence in to show your kids got in on their qualifications. Why do judges, I didn't, I didn't know until only very recently that a judge could do that. The judge could tell you, you can't present any evidence to show that you're innocent if you're charged with something. Huh? But he did, and of course he got convicted, but he won on appeal. But it took years and years and years, and it took his entire life savings, $10 million. Now most people would just be obliterated by that. So what kind of judges are we putting out? Well, what kind of people are we electing? And really, is it too late? Can we still salvage our nation just by those of us who are believers rallying together, maybe getting those 32 million people who didn't vote, 32 million Christians, well, it would make a big difference in our government. <sighs> it just, you know, I still have a hard time wondering. If, it, if it's at the point now where it won't do, it won't save our nation. I mean, we just... What was once unthinkable became thinkable, then it, be, then it was allowed, and then it was mandatory, and it was monstrous things, like mutilating children. Just, that, that, that really goes back to the Moloch worshippers and such. But what are we supposed to do? Well, I came to a couple conclusions something we could do as believers and something we can do as citizens. So as believers, I found some hope in Psalm 146.3. First of all, do not trust in princes, in mortal man in whom there is no salvation. In other words, Yes, we should participate in our, you know, government as, as, as believers, and we should do what, what God would have us do, or at least what we think God would have us do. But still, we're only electing a man. We're not electing a, a savior. So, but, um, so in other words, you know, the Messiah will not come on Air Force One or through Congress and all that. So we should put not put our trust and our hopes in men. We should choose good men and women. But we should not put our hope in them. Go to Psalm twenty two twenty eight. For the kingdom is the Lord's, and he rules over the nations. So that's where we should start. We should do what we ought to do as followers of Christ. 
And as citizens, yes, vote and witness. And as believers, pray for revival. Because I think that's really what would change things. But don't go at it with the attitude that, well, we can do this and then God will do that. Whatever we do, do it because it's what we ought to do. And leave the rest to God. We trust in Him. We don't trust in princes of this world. Anyway. So, I think we have one more song, and I might actually need help with this one. Let's see, I thought I knew these three songs, but then I looked, and the last one I'm not sure I knew. But, so everybody else better sing loud. I might know it, we'll see. It's like, without a doubt, we'll know that we have been revived when we shall leave this place. So like I said, until then, let's just persevere. Do what we ought to do. Pray to God. Pray toward heaven, row toward shore. Anyway, let me do a quick prayer. And we can proceed with our Sabbath. Our Father in heaven, we thank you so much that uh, you have given us your word to live by, your word to share with all, all of our fellow citizens, and everyone we know. And we just like to ask you, Lord, to put your hand on us, encourage us, give us the right words to say when we go out witnessing to the rest of the world that we are supposed to be people in submission to you and your law and let that let that be our blessing to the world around us in your name Jesus amen, amen.